Today we welcome Barton Lynch, a surfing icon known for his 1988 World Championship victory and a celebrated career, who has since evolved into a mentor, environmental advocate, and a revered figure in the global surfing community. Barton, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Brad. Good to be here, mate. How are you? I am going really well, thank you. Managed to get a few waves, uh, small ones. I tried out a little Boost electric fin, which was an interesting experience. Have you ever tried one of those? No, an electric fin. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, no. what is that? These, <laughs> what is that? Uh, there's a little startup and they've created a, a rechargeable fin uh, that you screw on. There's an adapter for FCS and Futures, and it's mm -hmm. got a rotor blade in, <laughs> inside of it. Uh, USB charged, and yeah, you wear a little wrist strap, you push a button, yep. and you can either have a, a slow, consistent uh, burst of speed, or you can go full on to try and catch a wave. So I attached it to a tiny little 5.6, um, but quite a fat board, and yep. yeah, it, it's. I, I have to admit, it was kind of fun. I don't want to be that guy, <laughs> but so you use it to help you paddle. <laughs> Is that what it's for? Like, yeah, basically, in essence, it gives you a boost so that you can sit there relaxing on your board and just paddle past others. Because <laughs> I, I saw, I, I saw a friend of mine working, playing with that kind of idea a year or so ago okay. on a foil, and he had it with his foil, and he'd just kind of be laying there like that, you know, with his hands on the nose, and the board would just plod along out, and um, yeah. I remember thinking, what the hell? I, it just should stop if you can't paddle. No, I'm, 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 it's, um, that's interesting, eh? I see them use them for foils, right? The electric yes, yeah. foil. So yeah. This was built specifically for, for, for surfboards, and yeah. I, I think it's better on a longboard, although let's not give people ideas. Um, I, I tested not. it out. Yeah, let's not. I tested it out on a shortboard, and, yeah, no, it was uh, – surprisingly enjoyable but as soon as the waves got good you want to get that thing off because it's heavy and bulky and you, you really oh. don't want to, you don't want to have that yeah, on the tail it's, it's amazing the the just the incredible amount of technologies that come in and around the space eh, as people try to invent and create um new ways of doing things it's incredible yeah it really is there's a lot of innovation in the surfing world uh yeah. and, and and that extends out to things like your game um which yeah. which we've been go. trying uh yeah. i think it's it's awesome it's so much fun to play uh we have recorded a separate uh, mini interview about the game but perhaps just for those yeah. who, who who aren't going to go there you can tell yeah. us a little bit about the process what was it like actually building a surfing video game yeah, I mean, it was not something I've ever thought about. So when the approach came to me from the West Brothers from Bungara Software in Perth, Western Australia, they came to me and said, hey, we're building a video video game. We'd love to have you involved. And, um, you know, I worked largely in a lot of ways, you know, as a coach and a commentator, but as a consultant and help connect people to things in and around the surfing industry. I've had multiple products brought to me over the years for an evaluation and for input and feedback so consultancy is something i've sort of worked in and around that space so i thought i'd be helping them sign surfers bridging the gap between them and and the industry and i did all of those things and then they said and we want to call it barton lynch pro surfing and i think i said to you last time that was the first thing i said was surely you can get a better name than me you know i was like really there's got to be better than me um so that was kind of that part of it was kind of awkward, you know. I still feel a little awkward about it, um, but uh, it's a, a game that's based on a world tour, and it's the first time there's been that structure of a video game. Twelve locations around the world. You can free surf or compete in those locations, so it's not only competing. The fact that you can go to these places and just free surf um, is very cool. The weather tool's amazing. The companies we got on, you know, on board, uh, you know, the mainstream companies, and then the the same with the surfers. The surfers we signed four years later after signing them have all gone to a whole nother level with their careers. And I was very grateful for my scouting abilities. Really, when I reflect, I go, "Wow, you pick good people." 
That mm. worked. You know what I mean? Even with a two-year delay in production, um, they just continued to get better and better, those guys. So that really was a, a big positive for me. I felt good about that. You know, I didn't sell them down the garden path on someone who was no longer anything in surfing. So, yeah, that was great. Yeah, that must be quite fulfilling to see those people that you knew and had connections with and that you handpicked flourish in their own careers, in their own right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, we went to Kelly Slater and John John Florence and people like that. Um, and, you know, pe they weren't really interested. And then the people that we picked um, have all just gone on to amazing things with their careers. So, yeah, it's very cool. And, you know, for me, I haven't played the game yet. Um, so I'm really keen to actually get that part of it done and understand what it is we've built. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully people love it. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that, uh, a good friend of mine, I don't have a PS five, yeah. but a good friend of mine does. And mm -hmm. uh, he, the feedback so far is positive. He said, this is, this fills a space in his, and he's a, a lifelong surfer. It fills a space right. in, in his gaming collection because right. there wasn't anything comparable, right? For a long time. Yeah. You know, there was that little game that you could play on your mobile phone for a while. Yeah. That got quite yeah. addictive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But this is a whole new level on it with uh, upgraded graphics and, you know, new destinations. Yeah, so the feedback yeah. is good. Oh, good to hear that. And, and largely it's been that way too. You know, uh, the voice always said to me, people either love it or hate it. <laughs> and yes. so, you, you, you know. We're just doing the best we can. They're continually refining, developing, evolving, taking feedback on board, ch making changes, creating what they call patches and set, putting mm. the patches in with updates to the game. Um, we talked to Italo Ferreira about being one of the uh, earliest sort of people that we put in. Aaron Brooks wanted to be in the game as well. So we're looking forward to putting some new people in the game and continuing to grow it, you know, build it. Yeah. We, we talked yeah. about innovation. And I was wondering, what are your thoughts on the, the evolution of surfing? I mean, a lot's mm. happened. In some ways, not much has happened at all. Surfing is still the same as it always has been. We're riding yes. waves on little watercraft. But yes. what are your thoughts on, on, on innovation and where surfing goes next and, and where it's been over the past couple of decades? I mean, you just, it's gone to places I never imagined. I didn't think people would ride as big a waves as they're riding. There's absolutely no way I ever yeah. considered that. They're, they're more than twice as big as what I thought they would ride. You know what I mean? Like when you think of a 20-foot swell at Wyomere and a big swell at Wyomere and you go, okay, um, what people regularly ride on outer reefs, Nazare, towing in, Chopu, the, the 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 style of wave, the complexion, Nathan Florence, he, what he, what Nathan released today of his year of just just the craziest waves, craziest wipeouts. I never imagined people would be able to ride waves like they do. Absolutely mm. no way. It's way beyond what I imagined. Jet skis are a major part of that evolution. Without the ski and the ability to be out there and go, well, maybe you could paddle. You know, you didn't think you could paddle. You didn't think those waves were surfable because the ocean was so out of control. You didn't even think you'd be in it. You couldn't yeah. be in it. Now, with the help of jet skis, you can get yourself out into oceans that man maybe should not be in. <laughs> yes. and, and people are riding waves that are beyond anything we ever thought. Um, then you look at the foil. I never imagined people would be riding foils, hovercrafts, surfboards that fly. Um, above the water and able to turn and that is that whole foiling thing is enormous potential who knows where that goes I saw um, someone riding jaws on one just recently on that last mm. swell mm. And, and he was in the pocket mate he was radical so I don't know where that goes either mate the things and then all the airs you know I think there's massive improvement to be made on the backhand the backhand line is largely the same line that we did, off the bottom, off the top, tight to the pocket. Not much difference between Gabriel's backhand and Damien Hardman or Mark Ocalupo's backhand, you mm. know, in reality. So I feel like there's room for evolution. I've got some manoeuvres in mind for the backhand that could change that up. That needs to happen. Needs some variety put into it, you know. Um, but as far as who knows, I'd have no idea, mate. You know what I mean? Like. 
one of those things I noticed once was I was watching a show and I thought I was watching basketball, but then it pulled back and I realised I was watching a video game and they show the two people playing basketball and then they draw the shot back even further and there's a crowd watching the people play the video game of playing basketball. And I went, wow, audience, audiences will watch people play a video game like they're watching a sport. And so mm. who knows where the old armchair video game world tour ends up. There could be surf-offs around the world of people playing the game and having qualified for finals of events. And so there's all sorts of um, opportunity in and around that space and then the opportunity to imprint your mind with surfing is significantly better for your health than shooting people or being at war, Call of Duty, whatever it is. And in my mind, those violent video games should be made illegal. Mm. They are not the type of thing you want to stick into your brain, mate. Yeah. That's dangerous stuff. And I'd love to know, you know, if they I wonder if they've ever looked at the shootings that happen, you know, on an annual basis, say in America, and whether they researched the gaming behavior of the shooters and whether they had backgrounds of playing violent video games that desensitized. Like I couldn't think of anything weirder than getting a gun and going out and shooting someone. Oh. That is so far from my reality, mm-hmm. and I would not play it on a game because I would not put that stuff into the, something I value, like my mind. Um, but the the shit that people stick in their heads and in their minds and in, and and program themselves and desensitize themselves to violence in that case, um, sh- those things should be gone, mate. They should be mm. outlawed with the old two party political system. You know what I mean? Right. Because you look at you look at the Democrats and the Republicans in America, Liberal and Labor. I look at them as criminal organisations, and I reckon that's the first thing that we should do is get rid of the two two major political parties should be both outlawed in all these free what were free Western countries, mm. and we should politicians should be representatives of their community not a member of a party because the compromise to our political systems because of their allegiances to a party, not to the voters, is the problem. Mm. So get rid of the political parties, get rid of the violent video games and, and, and go surfing and put surfing in your, in your mind. That's what I've wow. got. That's how, that's how I kind of, you know, in the process of me justifying involving myself with a video game, for example, you know. Yeah. Um, gazillions of people will do it whether I do or not. That's not the point. You know yeah. what I mean? My point. But I really do feel like the um, the shooting games, the war games, the violent games are really not good for people's minds, you know? Yeah. So that's how I went. Well, if I can give them something to play that's better, that actually is not like fun, connected yeah. to nature, that's, yeah. kind of, you know, that's how I could do this. Definitely. And, of course, there are times when people can't surf. This is part of the surfing life. You have to wait it out sometimes. So if yes. you're going to play something, well, you know, option one, go outside, do something else, cross train. Yes. But when you're going to sit on the sofa, instead of watching mindless Netflix dramas or uh, playing action video games where you're shooting strangers across the world, yeah, go surfing. Go surfing on your computer. And, you know, it's same, I'm like that with document. I don't watch acting. It's very rare that I can watch acting and not know they're acting. Yes. It's, it going, it's, it's, not, it's just not convincing, you know, and I go, it's a waste of my time, mate. Why would I sit there and watch I need to learn something. Where's yes. the documentary that tells me and teaches me something, you know? Mm. So you've got to value your time. It's the only asset yeah. we've all got. Exactly. And it becomes even more important to be discerning when you're scrolling on your phone because the algorithms get to know you so well that it's going to serve you more of the content that either enrages you or gives you a brief moment of pleasure. And before my, you know, my, an, an hour The algorithm gone. gives me good stuff. <laughs> yeah. I, get, I get sent great stuff. The old <laughs> algorithm knows me really well, man. Same. It's got me. I keep yeah. just going, wow, wow. Keep sending me this stuff. Thank <laughs> you. I like it. I know. It's crazy. The The most dangerous thing I find is the shorts. You know, those short videos yeah. that last a few right. seconds. 
because you get a dopamine hit and you scroll and another one and you scroll and at least I'm starting to get some surfing content in there, which is great because yeah. you know, at least it's an alternative to some of the other uh, crazy stuff that, that I tend to consume. Exactly. Um, interesting. So over the course of your career, obviously competitive mm-hmm. surfing has been a, a an important part of that. Uh, what yes. do you think of how competitive surfing has evolved because i'll just to frame that question please a few of my close friends and uh, and maybe it's just our generation maybe we're getting a little bit busier but we're not really following competitive surfing anymore i was talking to a good yeah. friend over the weekend and we're like we used to froth over you know the the next yeah. event that was being held but it just doesn't seem it's all it seems a little bit plain i don't know it's not as exciting as when you had no. kelly and andy and others no, I well, you know, I think, I think a couple of things. One, I believe that there's, there's generational ch- <laughs> get them. No. But there's uh, generational changes that take place in surfing, and yeah. the '70s was the Hawaiian generation: mm. Jerry Lopez, Roy Russell, ben- Barry Kanai, Puni, Reno Abalera, that Tom Michael Ho, Dan Kilahoa as the younger parts. Of that. that generation of the 70s was amazing. Then the 80s was kind of an Australian period of time. Mm. Then the 90s was the momentum generation and the Americans had their time. The 2000s has been Brazil. Um, and we're watching, you know, those things change. I see the, the European time of dominance not far ahead. There's incredible surfers out of European countries right now coming through, especially at the World Juniors. That was they were very good. Um, so these things happen naturally. You know what I mean? These generational changes. And I think we connect with different generations romantically mm. or not. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and we're more yeah. involved or engaged or not. But that said, the ISA, the International Surfing Association, that has forged and created the Olympic game opportunity and evolved its products and events to a place that are Really quite a very cool representation of surfing. For me, I go to those events now, like, and I, I watch these evolving nations. You'll see a heat with a kid from Chinese, Tom pa- Taipei and John John Florence. And it's a yeah. complete mismatch, but it's not the point. Mm-hmm. It's about more than the competition. And it's about this community coming together and the, the developing nations being inspired by the developed nations and the sport of surfing growing. There were 365 kids from 46 nations at this ISA. At the, um, at the Opens, it's, you know, they, they, I suppose I'm not sure how many member nations they have now, but it's like 60, 70 nations that are member nations that can p- participate. And they're, you're, they're a part of a team. So they're there competing as a team and the energy and the excitement and the emotion and the passion, the highs and the lows of the team's journey um, through the individuals is just a great thing to watch. It's so super cool. Mm. And they, they have be, when they used to be called 60s, 70s, ISA, you know, surfing Australia, surfing wherever, New Zealand, wherever. Um, those were the, the major representative bodies. Then I, I, uh, IPS came along in the 70s, late 70s, yeah. right, 76, first year. Um, and then it went to ASP, then to WSL. They are really more commercial organizations, WSL, than the representative body of the sport because ISA was, then it went to IPS and ASP, and it was those were – through those years, the ISA wasn't very – exist it didn't exist it was like professional and amateur of which there is no professional amateur anymore and the isa has risen its job of doing what it does to a level that far supersedes the easy road that asp and wsl had in the early days because they isa wasn't as productive and purposeful and good at what it does now it would sit where isa and its member nations are clearly the representatives of surfing. The, the Olympic Federation acknowledges that. Um, all of these member nations join the ISA. It is surfing. And WSL is a commercial product on the side. Yes. And that's the reality. It, it, it produces the world champion, 
But I think the Olympic gold medalist, the Olympic champions may be more important than the world champion now anyway. Mm. So in a very short period of time, Olympic engagement and involvement in the sport has changed that landscape. To, and WSL have done a good job of being shitty at what they do. <laughs> Pretty much. Let's face the fact. And imagine you sitting there and you've got Pipeline as your jewel in the crown and you can you can cr crown champions at this perfect left and right, which is just this most even playing field. It's the most perfect playing field. It's got all the history of forever of deciding world champions. And you, in your wisdom, go, no, no, we're going to go to California. <laughs> like, seriously, yeah. crazy mm. decisions. So you, and, and, you know, even even – the judging, the one thing, they've fiddled around the sport, the mid-year cut. What a suck of an idea that is. What a terrible thing that is. Um, the Challenger Series I like. I actually find the Challenger Series more interesting than the World Tour. And At the end of this year, the Tour's ended, right? So even if you think chronologically and you go, okay, we finished the Challenger Series and then we finished the World Title because the World Title's the ultimate. And the challenger is just to qualify for a chance to do that. So sequentially, we should finish the challenger before the – but they do it the other way around. Yeah. They finish the world title, decide that before the challenger, just to really confuse people. And, and then the challenger, I was watching the challenger and seeing the, the people qualify and the emotion around people like making the tour next year and going, oh, this was in, that was enjoyable for me. That felt like a real, the most enjoyable part of the whole WSL year was the end of the Challenger Series. Um, so I feel like they've just jumbled things up, mixed stuff around, had these ideas for change because the business model might not have been working as it was for them yeah. or they saw another way of doing it. But I think it's fair to say the new way of doing it. They might say their numbers are up in viewership and things, I don't believe it. I don't think mm. anyone really believes it, you know, because every, you know, it's like, it's like the politicians coming out and going, no, prices are coming down, inflation's not a thing. And you go, yeah. well, on the street, we know it is. You can lie all you want. Yeah. You know what I mean? Tell us things aren't more expensive than that. We know that you're ruining the economies and maybe it's a deliberate destruction for a reset of, of society, but you're mm. definitely messing stuff up. We don't, have to, yeah. you know, we don't need you to tell us. We know, and it's the same way with WSL. the The amount of feedback I get of a similar nature to, to yours, and, and people have disengaged, and it's a multiple of reasons, but it's just bad management, mm. and the management not having an understanding and a feeling for what floats the surfing boat. I, I, I honestly believe you could. The first thing you got to do is fix the judging. Yeah, you know, and I have, I have strong ideas in and around a system of judgment that would fix that thing in a heartbeat and make it way more entertaining and make it um, not something that's hidden. Judges mm. are like people you never see. You don't know who they are. They hide out. They come in. They do their job and they're <laughs> shuffled off, you know. So you <laughs> never know. You don't even know. You don't see them. You, don't, you know what I mean? The judges need to be visible. They need to be open. They need to be accountable. And mm. they need to be able to do what they're judging. If you can't do what's being done, you have no right judging it. I honestly believe I'm not good enough to be a judge because I don't understand the technicality of the air game. It's way, and even the critical nature of some of the stuff they do, I get it. And I'm good enough to commentate it and I can illuminate in and around the space. But in terms of decision making and, and, and little tiny increments of difference, I'm not good enough, mate. You need CJ Hobgood in there and Shane yeah, Dorian and, you know, you need they need three founding fathers of the performance aerial surfing who are the most respected people their money can buy. And then when they score the rides, the problem is the system now, it's set up and it needs five people to agree to succeed, right? So when the score wave's ridden, deep down inside the subconscious of the judge, He's going, where are we going with this? Mm -hmm. Where are we going? What are the boys and the girls thinking? Where are my other judges going to put this score? And I don't want to be the high or the low and get knocked out all the time because then I look bad. So you're not really appreciating the ride and going, okay, what about the ride? You're going, well, how do we, how do we make the system look right by all coming in close together? That's wrong. You know? 
Mm. That's wrong. And it, it's set up to fail because of that simple premise that it needs five people to agree. Never going to mm. happen. So they're Never fighting up against they're fighting against a broken system, and mm. and it's not a personal thing. The people judge the judges, the good people, mate, doing the best they can with yeah. a broken system. With but a broken you, you system. If you've got if you've got good people, you shouldn't have to knock off the high and the low. All their opinions should be respected, and they should. You know, the old system used to give decisions five nil, four one, or three judges to two. Your five judges, and they don't. You don't have to keep scale that way. I can call it a four. You could call it an eight. I could not even have it in my top two, and you could. We could still have the same winner. Yeah. Right, because we're not comparing scale, and my job's to appreciate it and then communicate with the commentary. So we go on there in commentary, and comes down. Brad's given it an eight, and CJ's given it a four, and we cross up to the judges and go, "Hey, Brad, what did you see that you love so much?" We saw CJ went down; he had a four. We just spoke to CJ. He reckons he lost control at the bottom, and when he did that, he lost speed, and he didn't like that way that set up the ride, and he thought the rest of the ride. Could have been an eight, but he blew it at that point. Why did what did you see? And then you tell us what you saw. And we mm. educating the public through having elders of the tribe passing on the traditions of what is good surfing and evaluating and giving us the decisions. And they're educating the public by becoming a part of your broadcast that makes it even more interesting. So there's ways to fix it. I've told every single person at WSL for the last 10 years, five years that. Let me, I've said, let, if you've got an event that's going to be run that's just a specialty or whatever, give me the judging. Let me show you how this will work and fix this fucking problem for you. You know, yeah. they have no interest in fixing the judging, it would seem. They think they can fix their problems by changing everything around the outside of the important thing and not touching the important thing. Mm. It's just crazy. So it is. I think they've done a good job at alienating the core and really not understanding the culture and really they're using, in a lot of ways, they're using pro surfing as a political tool to, to help usher in a global agenda, as I see it. Wow. That's yeah. the saddest part of the whole thing to me is that mm-hmm. really in a lot of ways WSL is a woke organisation as such as they would be termed mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and it's using surfing to propagate woke ideology which to me is not the deal, mate. The yeah. of this culture has its thing. It is a thing. It's not something to be bought and then marketed to fit in with a political agenda. Our, our culture stood against that type of stuff. It stood for freedom and individuality and the person's rights to be and do who they want without having to fit in. Yeah. So I feel like that's been, you know, that is in part, I alienated a lot of surfers as well because it's in the hands of people that aren't surfers mm-hmm. dressing it up as they want to dress it up. Yeah. Put as much as they say, you put as much lipstick on the pig as you want. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's I think that's where that's been part of the disconnect from the audience with the product. Yeah. I I, I agree. Do you think that surfing is gonna go super woke and we'll end up with <laughs> You know, people of all kinds of genders competing. Well, okay, let's be real. We'll have people who were men competing in the women's division. Well, I mean, for me, just give them their division. I agree. You know, because yeah. cause it, it, in essence, you've got to, you know, personally, your choices to be and do and see yourself as you wanted, you're there, yours, mate. Do what you want. Yeah. Dress yourself up, do whatever you want with your life, live it however you want. But don't expect me to have to validate you for you to feel whole. You know what I mean? Don't care what I think. What I think's got nothing to do with how you behave. You do your thing, mate. Live it how you want. So it's just the it's the use of a people's for a political agenda. And the peoples were so desperate for support that they can't even believe they're getting it, most probably. But the support is very superficial in essence because it's got itself. And I always kind of reflect on a parent and being a parent and a, grandpa, a grandparent. Um, 
being self-righteous, being judgmental, and thinking you know are three things, behavior patterns that are not the good sign, or not a sign of a good person. If someone is judgmental, yeah. they're self-righteous, and they think they know and they're telling you how you should be and how you should live and how you should think, they're not good people, mate. That's the bottom line. That's my experience of 60 years on earth. I've been around a lot of people who have tried to tell me what's up, mm -hmm. like they know and like I should. And I don't need to be told. I ain't no. listening. I know my stuff. I know my life. I know my beliefs. I know my, my values. I've been around. I've seen enough to understand how I am in the middle of all this stuff. And you can do whatever you want. So don't go telling me nothing. That's what I say. No. I ain't listening. Full stop, mate. I know. I listen to my heart. I'm connected to my heart. I'm not connected to the media. I'm not connected to, to other people's opinions. You know, one of the most wonderful things I saw the other day was a Instagram post that had this massive, massive shed. And all of a sudden, the shed goes up and starts moving along the ground. And it's the Amish moving this shed. And they would have had, I reckon the size of this shed, they would have had 3,000 people in there. And they're just in the front line. You can just see 60 sets of feet. And they're all shuffling along together. And they pick up this massive, massive shed and just move it their way. Old school Amazing. humans coming together, and I've never, I've never really been Amish. I've never like looked at the religion. I don't understand the principles, but what I respect is them being them. Mm -hmm. They don't care what you say. They don't care what you think. They got their stuff, mate, and they're doing it their way. And they don't have a lot of the problems the other, the outside way has. And you're going to try and tell them what's up. And they're like, you need a crane and truck drivers and all this stuff to move the shed. We just get our people. So we just move the shed. And yeah. it was a fantastic, I just saw it and it was such a wonderful sign of people being strong in themselves, strong with their faith, with their religion, with their ideas. Mm. And they don't, they don't care what you think. They don't care that someone's down on the corner of the street and they're a male and they're dressed as a woman. They don't care. They're doing mm. their thing, mate. You do yours. This whole concept of forcing certain people's ways upon everyone else and trying to destabilize the premise of a male-female relationship as the cornerstone of humanity's existence. Our speech, yeah, you know, you could go and you could, um, you know, say it's a gay couple without science. Um, the species ends. Yeah. Right? That's, and that, that is a, you know, without science, without the male female union as a premise of our, our species survival, it's how we continue. It's how we survive. It's why and how we're here. The miracle mm. of our life is out of that male female union. And, um, if we feel like we live in a technological age that may have gone too far, that's how I feel. I look mm. at AI and I go, mate, we, I think a lot of us are all being repulsed and repelled the other way. We are. You know, where we don't want to go to the supermarket to buy our food, we'd like to grow it. We don't want to, you know what I mean? There's all of these parts of technology, says he who just flew back from Brazil yesterday. So there's a certain level of you know, hypocrisy and things in, in certain parts of, of the way I feel about myself and those things as well. You know? But at the same time, I think a lot of us would rather go the other way than forward into a technological age of robots and AI and things that steal the humanness from from the planet. You know, so there's a lot of there's little you know, conversations that go on all around all of this mm. stuff. But fair mm. to say, um, the crazy times out there, man. Yeah. The crazy people That's... who are. Did I hear that the New Zealand health minister just released? He is no longer the health minister and he is under arrest, as I understand it, um, for releasing the data on the vaccines and the health implications well, so for New Zealand. Apparently, 
So it's completely suppressed in New Zealand. You have to go and find this information somewhere else, of course. Uh, they're, mm -hmm. they're calling him an IT worker, but apparently this particular individual was responsible for the databases, like designed yes. the databases. But now they're just saying, oh, no, it's just an IT guy who uh, who's spreading misinformation. Whereas, of course, from what I've same seen, way. yeah, misinformation is the code word for, you know, anything we don't yeah. like. Um, but apparently, yeah, he just created some correlations and who knows if it's accurate. I'm no data scientist, but it's certainly worth discussing. And in any normal environment, people would say, oh, wow, that's interesting. Shouldn't we talk about this considering that Should, yeah. tax money was invested in whatever intervention? It's worth a conversation, right? Rather than just arresting and uh, silencing. Well, you know, we, we don't trust them, do we? I don't trust them. There's not a politician in our countries. Well, I would look at Australia and there's, there's a few politicians there where I go, hey, that guy at least is risking it all and telling the truth and trying to, you know, stand outside of the two-party system. And, you know, I suppose in America, there were Robert Kennedy Jr. who yeah. seems I've had a conversation <laughs> with, with that gentleman at one point in a, in a, and he seems like a fantastic – he seems Great. like he gives you hope. You go, wow, we're a chance, mate. He's outside of the two-party system. Mm. and. You know, he's got, he's got the roots that go back into true freedom, you yeah. know, with, with his uncle. And so, you know, yeah. we live in hope, but as long as there's those two parties in control, they're the problem. Yeah. You've got, like, you got two in New Zealand? Have you only got yeah. two primary parties? There's, or? there's two primary, and in order to create a government, uh, one of the smaller parties, or two in this case, have to group together with one so it's a coalition yes. government and then yes. you know there's all this compromise before a government is formed okay, the well, in yeah, yeah yeah exactly so uh, this is more of a conservative government that's just come in promising right. lots of change but mm, yeah whatever <laughs> they're, they're same, same different the same coin eh? yeah different side yeah. exactly yeah. it's a, as long as lobbying exists I, i'm pretty exactly. sure that nothing changes Ah, one hundred percent. Again, when you look at the criminality of political behaviour, people coming into power with not much and going out with heaps. Yeah, you know, it's um, it seems, and and again, you just get a smell for these things when you've been around long enough, and you, mm. you know, and you just get a smell for it, don't you? And it's not, it's 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 something that the science might not validate but the yeah. science might be as compromised as anything else and oh. um and and your heart might be a true way to indicate and in recent times i've been feeling you know there's i suppose you've got a concept of a great reset yep. and a concept of a great awakening and they yeah. would be these two concepts that float around for the future the great reset is a movement of the established guard trying to protect their position in the future. Um, the Great Awakening is a, a people's movement as such, which suggests a evolution in consciousness. Yes. And when you think that the way the media are behaving, I mean, seriously, their, their approval rating or the people, the amount of people that believe what the mainstream say would have to be under 50%. Not many people sure. really believe what they hear. Right, no. not many people trust them anymore. They're, they're, they, you know, the whole COVID thing has proven them to be most probably criminal, to be on the take, and to be not vested in the interests of the people, but in the vested in the interests of those that pay them. And so, what that does to us as members of the public, if you can't trust what's out there, and what you've all, you know, been told to trust in the past, and and we did. Gullible fools, you yeah, go, wow. We've probably been lied to forever, eh? Wow. Oh, um, for sure. The, the great awakening would be the sending of individuals back into themselves for validation of truth. And so as you go back into yourself, because everything outside of you has been destabilized, you move into yourself for, val to, for understanding. You connect with yourself and your truth and your heart and your, your own values. And out of that, you, your consciousness awakes. And so the great awakening might be based and steeped in the fact that we're all getting sent to ourselves for the truth. 
We're not going outside anymore for the truth. We're going inside for the truth, which is just the most beautiful thing. It's the most yeah. wonderful, wonderful thing. And and I've in trying to understand what a great awakening may be, I kind of got to that point where I went, well, that might be the premise of the great awakening is that that they've devalued themselves and their the politicians, the media, they've devalued their place in society through their their game playing and people are going to themselves for how they feel about it and for their truth. And in that they're awakening their consciousness and there's a collective consciousness arising that that doesn't actually need to be told. They know what's up. Mm. You know? I feel like that's an exciting time to be a part of. It really is. And I think there is so much doom and gloom and people focusing on all of the negative. I mean, I read that nine, yeah. out, of 10, nine out of 10 news articles are negative for a reason. No, it's sells... supposed to be more than nine, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, well, where's that one? nine out of 100. It's supposed to be 9.5, eh? 95. Yeah, exactly. Like, exactly. where's the good news show? Where's the yep. show that talks about all the people that donated, all the initiatives that happened on a daily basis around the world where people clean this up and fix that up and yes. sack that guy, move that guy, you know, and all. There's so much good going on all the time and being in Brazil, that's what I've been feeling lately is um, everywhere I go, the goodness that I've been receiving from people, I'm so grateful. I'm so appreciative mm. of every single human I've come into contact with who's just been so wonderful, eh? Hey? Because just yeah. going, hey, we love you, mate. Give me a home in Brazil. I was just, it was amazing. Look, let me just show you a couple of things quick. People kind of respect what you did. These, these are these. This is from those of the old school here. How do we pronounce it? I reckon Ita Coachiara. Yeah, old school boys. They gave me that little trophy, a plaque. Way. Fabio Motes painted that picture of me. Oh, that's awesome. Of this old 80s photo. He no came way. and found me at the event and gave me that and said, I love you, mate. Here, yeah, good on you. Then Luciano Cabal came and gave me this image. No that way. He made with the Australian flag, the kangaroo up there, the beard blowing in the wind. <laughs> that's so cool. And then, and that's the view from a hotel room when I was in Rio, and he gave me that as well. Ah, uh, and so everywhere I've been going, mate, people have been mm -hmm. giving, mate, sharing, caring, and so appreciative of what I've given them. And I go, what do I do? You know what I mean? Like, and really, just been me, and I'm just kind of so I've stayed, I suppose through a hard time in life um, for everybody. I haven't just shut my mouth. Mm -hmm. I haven't just been quiet for an income. Um, the fact that, you know, I can be me and WSL won't employ me for, you know, who knows what reasons, but we can guess. Um, but ISA will because they care about that. their product and they care about, you know, they want me there and they want me commentating and they, they can separate things and they go, this is good for surfing and they have me there. And you go, well, I found, fell on my feet. I'm in the right yeah. place, you know, without and that feels like yeah. without, without compromising. And then the love I get back even, you know, you and I, we, we chatted offline after, which led to this conversation, didn't it, yeah. after our last quick chat about the game. And, you know, there's, there's so many people feeling like we feel, coming together, sharing them, of themselves with people because they respect that. They know that person won't judge them. Yes. And that person won't behave as a self-righteous asshole who thinks yeah. he can tell you that you're wrong because you believe a certain thing. How dare they? Mm -hmm. Wrong for one, right for another. You don't have the right to, to, to impose your will through guilt trips. Worst thing you do when you guilt trip your kids. You know what I mean? As a parent, yeah. you do it sometimes. You go, hey, if you wrote that, you might, something might happen, but if you do this, something might happen, and you guilt trip them into doing what you want. And then after you go, oh, don't do that, mate. That was terrible. And yeah. then you look at the behaviour of the governments of the world and they're the worst parenting. They're involved in the worst parenting of nations maybe ever. And the behaviour that they're exhibiting in their self-righteous, pompous, arrogant, judgmental manner in which they treat people, the way they treat the media, the way, the way they treat you know, everything is... It's just a bad example of parenting, mate. They're terrible parents. 
with no self-consciousness around the way they're behaving at all because they're getting paid to behave like it. Mm. Yes. So they, they, there's those behavior patterns that I try to keep myself in check on. Yes, yes. You know, because, you know, we're all, we can all be judgmental. We can all be self-righteous. We can all be those things. And if you try to live with some awareness around your behavior, you catch yourself and go, oh, it's doing it again. Stop it. But when you watch it at the very highest levels of authority in your society and they're behaving like the worst parents you've ever seen and exhibiting behavior patterns that a parent just should not, you, sh- you're more, you should be more responsible than to f- inflict your children with those behaviors. Mm. You know, that's what I feel like we kind of deal with is on a daily basis from, from the, the, the powers that be is this just disrespectful. Judgmental, disrespectful. With, with, with your kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have you always thought this way or has it been yeah. a personal evolution? You know, because you definitely have the courage to speak your mind. And I think so many people don't yet have that courage. But the more of us that do, the more chance there is that this great awakening can take place. So at least just a, yeah. some balance in the, in the world. I think punk rock was what, you know, when you were yeah. a teenager in the 70s, and punk rock was that I was a punk, mate. I was in, I loved it, mate. I loved that music. I loved the attitude. And then that, which is what first got me. And then you realize that there was a deep, sincere political message about punk rock. Yes. And it was pointing the finger at the authority of instruments of authority, the banks, the governments, the churches, and go, hey, watch out. Have a look at these guys. Aren't good people. This is bad, mate. They're bad guys. And I started watching them then, so that's 45 years ago. So I've really felt like this for a very long time. Mm. And I've been watching the behavior for a very long time. And I've very rarely been seen it as a good thing. Yeah. You know, I didn't really yes. look and go, wow, that's what the, I, I used to just say, it doesn't matter to me who's in power. My life don't change. You know what I mean? Because those Muppets would be in and out, in and out, in and out. Nothing oh. changed. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? But. Now we live in a time that um, it feels a little more orchestrated. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, not, it's not just coincidental that every news channel in the world publishes the same story. That's strange. That's not coincidence. Yeah. You know, it's actual orchestrated it's, um, between the pandemic, between the propaganda. It's, you just watch it and it's hard to believe it's not orchestrated. You know, yeah. you have to. You have to be living under a rock to figure it ain't orchestrated either because <laughs> it just looks so obvious to me. You know, I'm just like, wow, it's just so obvious. Even, you know, you, I, turn, I don't watch the television, but I'll turn on the news for a minute maybe to, to, to just to see the mainstream. And I'll watch a couple of minutes ago. I can't get watching. It's just so, just so off CNN, corrupt news network. They're freaking terrible, mate. I was in Brazil and that was English, you know, on the Brazilian telly. And, I'd, I'd switching through and I'd see it and I'd watch from his garden. No, I cannot. Way better watching the Brazilian soccer. Just yeah. having that background noise of the commentary of a Brazilian soccer match just warm my heart. You know, I suppose it's a scarcity mindset. We come from a time, you know, you don't have to go too far back until it was really, really gnarly. Mm. You know what I mean? Really yeah. gnarly. And, and, and then you look at the recent times with the protests around COVID and how the government's just brought out the military and the police and just beat the shit out of people. Yeah. Don't do as we're told. We, we will beat the shit out of you. Yeah. That's what I learned. It's still really gnarly. It still Maybe is. Maybe more gnarly, you know, because they, they're, they're, <laughs> they're ready to sacrifice anyone and anything to achieve their, their success. And mm. um, the disrespect, you know, I don't remember a conversation. Any, any social change of these magnitudes – should be the subject of referendums. Absolutely. And given blockchain, given blockchain technology, we, we will soon live in times where we don't need governments, essentially. Governments could be small little things that, that are run by people as a collect, on a collective blockchain database of just we decide where that 50,000 goes or where that 100,000 goes. You know, you get that a lot in America. Americans. Homeless is, is just radical. The situation in certain cities is out of control, the crime, the, and they just, they just feel like 
they're going backwards at 100 miles an hour and they're mm. sending money to other countries to help them. Yeah. No, well, what, is... what about the home? What about, what about, what, how does this work? How come we're sending yeah. all this money to the Ukraine when homeless we've people. got homeless people all over our country and people not being able to eat and, you know, all these radical problems? And, you know, you go, well, it might smell like money laundering at the highest, in the highest regard. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, it's, it's hard to, it's, it's just so many things that don't make sense around about now that, um, you just got to keep the hope, as you you know you were saying before. You know yeah. it's easy to kind of get bogged down in it, but you just got to. People are so good, eh? The humans people of the are world. So we ah. they're so good, mate. You just go down to a beach, hang with some people, go yeah. you know, shopping centre, see whatever it is. The people are good, mate. We're all it, it, that. What's going on up there is disgraceful, and what's going on down here just fills me with hope. Yeah, you know? power games versus everyday people. I know when I've traveled, pretty much everyone is awesome. You get invited to people's homes for dinner and it's just right. people living their lives and you have conversations. And like I, I, I can count on maybe one hand how many people I've encountered who are truly bad. Yeah, you got your wallet nicked or you this or yeah. that. And, and then at the point you kind of go, well, they're just trying to live. Yeah. Guy just needs to eat. He's to yeah. feed his family. That's his job. He's stealing passports, whatever. You know what I mean? At a point, there's that there, yeah, totally. And I mm -hmm. agree. I think the people, we we the people, as that concept of we the people, the masses of humanity that are just the proletarians, your normal everyday people, such good folk, mate. Hey? Uh, so I've been so getting good. treated. I've just got so much respect and love for, for that belief and faith that you know we are good because I've been just – Seeing it everywhere I go, so yeah, yeah, likewise. that keeps that keeps you that keeps you up, and you know, you just keep the telly off so you don't have to watch those Muppets. Yeah, and yeah. Um, you're okay, you know. Keep your eyes open. Then, I mean, again, social media. Imagine without social media, what we would know? How little? How manipulated? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how control. Thank gosh for social media because we get to choose. You can see all sorts of stuff. Anything you want, you can see, but you get to choose and you get to decipher and 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 agree with what makes sense to you. What's your thing? So yeah. I'm really such a big fan of social media at this point in time and the fact that one information's out there. WikiLeaks, mate, couldn't you know? He got that. He got all that information, shared the truth with the world, and they lock him up because they don't want the truth out there. He, that Julian Assange is a freaking great example of everything that's wrong with the world. Mm, you know, we'll look back he on him be as... out and be respected for, for having the courage to support and give we the people the truth. You yeah. know, instead, the powers that be hate that, which would be Barry Young in New Zealand. You got it. Right? Yeah. And yeah. They put out some truth. And they went, ah, yeah. lock yeah. him up. Lock him up. And so it, it, it's a. It's, uh, you know, challenging times for everyone, eh? It's been, you know, for me, everything, it's hard to, to just pay the bills. It's hard to stay ahead. It's like the thing, every as soon as you get a little bit, I'll go and do a job. You know, Phew, we've got to, oh, it's gone. The, yeah. the, the fridge broke and the washing machine broke. Oh, it's gone. Mm. You know, and it's just, it's, it's hard, to, um, it's hard to, to, to see them print money, billions and billions, with no impact on the value, you go, well, how can America just print a trillion dollars and it not impact the value? Broken. Yeah. You know? And then why should we, why do we have to pay back our debt? But can, America's never paying it back its debt. No. Right? They can't. So the yeah. debt's never going to get paid back. Why do we have to pay? Mm. And I saw that a meme from Malcolm Roberts, a politician in Australia who uh, has been a flag bearer for truth against all all onslaughts, you know. It said, you you know, you, you, you earn your money, you get taxed, your income tax. Then you pay your tax on everything you buy. Then they tax you for the things you own that you pay tax on when you bought it with money that you pay tax on. And they just, you go, mate, when do you stop? When Give yeah. up, stop, mm. you know. Stop yeah. it. Give, have some respect for the people. And if you can print the money, give them all some. Totally. <laughs> if that's yeah. the game. 
That's mm. if it's that easy and we can just run a system that creates a base standard of existence that provides health and safety to people, you know, and, and then on top of that, you have free market capitalism for those that want to grow and build and create and, you know, not yes. just happy get money and live in. Um, you know, I think you can create something that's got a good base in place because the thing's fake. Mm. That's the reality now. And, yeah. and we're not on the good side of fake. So Richard, Richard uh, Kiyosaki say, rich people don't pay tax because debt, you don't pay tax on debt. So you just get, you know, you borrow the money to do your stuff. And because it's borrowed, you don't pay tax because you're in debt. Yeah. So that's how they stay not paying taxes because it's all borrowed money. Mm, it's all you're never debt. Playing, you're never playing with your own. And then ordinary yeah. people are. <laughs> that's the problem. Yeah. You can't get your hands on theirs. They're just continually milking yours out of your hands with this tax and mm. that tax. And yeah, it's, it's, it's Maybe. a wild setup, eh? Hey? But we let them get away with it, I suppose. Mm. They've been getting away with it forever and we let them get away with it. And yeah. Hopefully it's, uh, it can right its wrongs and work for the majority because I suppose that's for me it's um, capitalist capitalism, free market capitalism really must only work in cycles of time because at a point in a cycle of capitalism, everything's owned by a few things and it's no longer working for the majority, it's working for the minority. The money is held up in vaults up top and only out enough to keep making it is is let out yeah and that's where we're at so it's not really serving the it's serving the few not the many and so this capitalist cycle must be over yeah you're Getting right towards its end so the the great reset would would have acknowledged that situation and go, okay how do we the world economic forum with its stakeholders which obviously we're not because i don't remember them ever ringing me <laughs> and asking me what i think um I must not be a stakeholder, but they've they've come up with a way to negotiate and manage their wealth through this transition period out of one cycle into another cycle. But you'd have to be a fool to trust them to set the next one up. <laughs> Once it did this one, you can't uh, let them set up the next one. That just can't happen. No, exactly. And it's good to see some some opposition out there. I mean, I saw Jordan Peterson, like him or not, setting yeah. up the ARC, uh, Alliance for Responsible Citizens, something like that. And that looks interesting. I mean, the speeches were refreshing. And yeah, the so people good, there yeah. have good ideas. People doing great things. It's yeah. hard to find it because they'll censor it, yeah. fact check it. <laughs> but, you know, mm. but it's, you know. I just feel like if there's one thing I've learned from life, I don't judge situations as good or bad, or I try not to, because I never, in retrospect, it's always a different perspective. Mm. Like, oh, I thought yeah. that was the worst thing in the world. It kind of was good, wasn't it? It needed to happen. Yeah, I can see that now, you know? And so yeah. the judgment of a situation like now, as good or bad, is most probably transitory. We're on mm. the way to somewhere. We're not there. Yeah. And um, it needs to go somewhere. It needs to be rethought, restructured, rebuilt, um, repurposed. And uh, I suppose that's when what we're going through and the people who are here are here because they're meant to be here. For sure. You, know, yeah. you would yeah. imagine. So don't judge it as good or bad, although they're trying to inundate us with the bad so we don't see the good, like you said. Mm. The news is designed and created to put you in a place. It's a yeah. tool of manipulation. It's yeah. not information. Fear. So mm. that that you just got to keep those things in context and recognize the good in and around you hey, and your immediate. So yes. and that, that can keep you strong through the, the bombardment from above. Love it. I don't want to keep you too much longer, but something yes. that I, I've been wondering since I was a ten-year-old watching you win your 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 world championship. How cool was it to be uh, a world champ? Like, what was that year like? <laughs> I know you've been asked this a million times, but, you know, reflecting back. Not, not so much like that. Um, yeah, I mean, far out, hey, you got to live your dreams. Like, that was a dream. That was a little kid who didn't even live at the beach, his dream. And to think that I made that dream happen 
and I feel responsible. I know there's a lot of things that go into none of us get to choose where we're born. Israel, Palestine. None of neither of them got to choose. No one gets to choose. Yeah. We don't get to choose how we die and we don't get to choose how we're born. And where you're born and the circumstances you're born with, you watch people succeed and come through all sorts of different paths, you know. Um so for me though to have achieved that dream and know that I worked as hard as I did and had the faith and the creativity and the discipline and all of those things that were a part of making that dream come true, I fucking can't believe it, mate. Really, you know? I still just go, wow, you did it incredible, mate. And really, that's 35 years ago. Crazy. So competitive surfing was 15 of 60, so it was a quarter of my life. Mm. Um, it's not much. But it's a small chapter in that sense. It's everything, and it makes everything feel good. Yeah, um, you know, and it definitely helps me smile, and I just gives me confidence that hey, you can do shit, mate. You did shit. Yeah. Um. So that that's yeah, wonderful, mate. It really does feel wonderful. I'm so grateful that fuck, I did that, and and stuff has to happen. You know, Tom Carroll has to get an interference, and such and such has to beat such and such, and all this circumstance. But you got to put yourself there to be able to take advantage of it. And yeah, the fact that I did makes me quite proud. I must Mm. be honest. You know, I feel freaking. I'm stoked that we did that. That's unreal. (laughs) Yeah, I can't believe it. Actually, I love it. (laughs) Yeah, I feel good about it, mate. I feel I do feel good about it. Um, But. You know, I'm most probably happier with a lot of the stuff I've done since, you know, having to reinvent and recreate and wake up and earn money every day and pay your bills and maintain your freedoms and be yourself and try and keep the, the, the you know, the, the car on the track that you want to be, you know. Yeah, I've been a good life. It's been a great life, mate. It's been incredible. Yeah. I, you know, I've got to live my dreams. and fewfold you know my dream now is to just ride the most perfect waves in the world as many of them as i can before i'm dead i want to just get as many perfect waves and ride as many good waves as i can outside yeah. of that's my personal goal you know outside of the family and being a great dad and bringing up my kids and being around my kids and grandkids and that stuff my my own thing is just surfing yeah i, just want, to surf. I want to surf more i want to keep going i want to keep the dream alive and I haven't surfed really since June, so it's been five months of uh, fucking pain and anguish and injuries and surgeries and you know and work and pumping out the game and the blast off and all this stuff going on all at the same time as I was kind of in a pretty shitty place personally. You know, it was hard really? yards with the herniated discs and that whole two months I was on my stomach. Oh, on a mattress no. for two months, mate. I couldn't move. I'd leave the bed to the mattress in the living room and lay on my stomach for 24 hours a day in pain, couldn't take enough drugs to get out of pain. It was gnarly. It was two months of really freaking frustrating. Ah, hate uh, it. It's tough, but now, man. when you're out of that and you're not in pain, anything's good. I don't mind doing the dishes, anything. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. Well, not in pain. What Just is out the, of pain. Good. What is the perfect wave? What what does it look like? What are you riding? I like it. I like it. the perfect wave might be somewhere in the fifteen to twenty foot range Oof. back. You know, like what we call fifteen to twenty. Yeah. And um and I'd just be letting go of the rope and I'd be snowboarding into that thing and doing <laughs> big cars. Heel side, toe side, heel side, and then drop into the thing as it starts standing up and come around the corner and Park yourself in the pocket, come out of that. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's my – I love toe surfing, mate. I like toe surfing big waves. That's my favourite thing to do. It feels like snowboarding a big mountain and just flying at 100 miles an hour and I've surfed a lot of small waves and I just want to ride big waves and perfect waves. Uh. And that's kind of my focus. And I want to – you know, on most probably three months will be December 11th. Surgery was September 11th. Okay. They said three to nine months, and I said three's a deal. I'm not even here in nine. Yep. Can't even go in. Um, and three months will be December 11th. I've swam. I've paddled longboards. 
Um, and I've written a few waves on longboards because I was like, I stand on the ground. What's the difference? Really? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So I've written a few waves. So I feel like, you know, I'm just going to give it the three months. I'm going to start on December 11th and I'm going to get back into my surfing and rebuild that and just quit everything else. <laughs> uh, quit it all. I'm actually working it. on a book, book project too. So okay. I kind of want to kind of work on a project of telling my story and figure the best way to tell that story, whether through film or through words, written words. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got some ideas for some Stoke Bloke live shows and going places and doing some, some live shows with guests and everything and dinner and meals and creating this really nice night out. So we've got, there's a lot of, um, so one thing I've always been super motivated. I've always got more ideas than time. Yeah. And so I'm always doing stuff. I'm never, I'm never not doing something, never not working at something, creating something, building mm. something. And that's the, uh, that's the way I am. That's so when the they way, tell yeah. you to lock yourself down and stay at home, I start going, okay, what projects do we do inside? Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Inside yeah. and inside. Yeah, inside uh, inside. Yeah. yeah. We're not stopping. We're not gonna stop we're not gonna stop stop the uh stop living, you know, for fear of death. Yes. I'm with you and on I that. I think that was one of the great lessons from my dad dying when I was eleven, you know. He mm -hmm. died in a motorbike accident and you're here one minute, you're gone the next, and it's a fragile thing, so Yeah. We're gonna go live it. Thank you so much for the inspiration, for doing what you do, being yourself. I know so many people really admire the work that you've done and, you know, the body of work so far with lots more to come. I can't wait to hear more about the book project and yeah. the, the live talks. I mean, that would be awesome. You just, yeah, you, I think we'd have a good night out. I think we'd, and I'd get guests and tell stories and yes. I think, you know, create some packages for, for um, monitors to show monitors and stuff. I've got the, yeah. There's some really fun ideas of what you can do, you know. And that's the great. We live in amazing times in that Dude. sense, isn't it? You know, yeah. you ignore the politicians and you know, ignore the craziness of the power drunk, and, uh, and you go, you know, you just look at the opportunities for people to live and to communicate and create. It's yeah. a freaking great time to live. So, thank you, Brad. Awesome. Thanks, Barton. Awesome, it's mate. A it's a pleasure. I, I look forward to continuing the conversation in the future. And thanks to everyone who joined in. Martin, we'll see you next time. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Brad. Mm -hmm.